intervento Good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon. It's an honor today to have here Professor Ting. Sam Ting is one of the most influential and renowned physicists in the world of high energy physics. And uh, uh, he has been able to open new fields of research in particle physics. In 1974, uh, with his team, he discovered the J-particle that is one of the milestones of our understanding of the standard model. And now, uh, since uh, quite many years, is opening a new field of research looking for antimatter in the space. And we will know about that. Sam. Good afternoon. Uh, what I would like to do today is to share with you an experiment which uh, Roberto Battistone, a former graduate from your university, and Franco Cibelli, Marco Incagli, and others started some time ago. It's a simple little experiment by particle physics standard. Let me turn on my computer and tell you a small story. So, the experiment I will share with you is the alpha magnetic spectrometer on the International Space Station. The space station from here to here is 108 meters. From here to here is 80 meters. So it's exactly the size of a football field. It weighs 420 tons. Six astronauts live on board, and there's one particle physics experiment, only one, it's called AMS. The fundamental science on the International Space Station, known as ISS, can be simply visualized by realizing there are two kinds of cosmic rays traveling through space. Neutral cosmic rays, like light rays, neutrinos, have been measured for many years by Hubble Telescope, by Colby, by Planck, by WMAP, and others. Fundamental discoveries have been made. In fact, most of our understanding of cosmos have come from measurement of light rays. But then there are, besides light rays, there are charged particles positrons, electrons, protons, antiprotons, nuclei, maybe antinuclear. These particles, because they carry charge, it must have a mass. Because it has mass, it's absorbed in Earth's atmosphere. Therefore, to study the original cosmic ray, you must go to space. And because it carries a charge, you need a magnet, so to look the trajectory. To put a magnet in space is difficult because you all remember a magnetic compass, one end to the south and the other end is pointing to the north. And so if you put a magnetic spectrometer on the space station and send the sound the space station will be losing control. One end will point to the north, another point to the south. It is because of this very simple reason to put a magnetic spectrometer has started a long time ago, and this is the first successful implementation of the technology. So using a magnetic spectrometer, AMS, on the space station is a unique way to provide precision, 10 to 20 years, measurement of high energy 
charged cosmic rays. The physics of charged cosmic ray started in 1912 with the discovery of charged cosmic ray by Victor, he Victor Hess. In 1932, Pastor Thomas discovered by Carl Anderson. In 1947, Pi Meson was discovered by Cecil Powell. All three were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. Subsequently, many, many particles were discovered. After 1954, people began to build ex large accelerators, and then people move to accelerators. But as accelerators become more and more costly to go to space, it's an alternative way to study fundamental physics. This is a picture of AMS in space. And so far, we have collected 48 billion cosmic rays. And this is much more than all the cosmic rays collected worldwide in the last hundred years. The physics goal of AMS include the search for dark matter. We all know 90% of the matter in the universe is not observable, therefore it's called dark matter. This is a picture we're all familiar with, a galaxy seen by the telescope. But if you could see the other 90%, the galaxy may look like this. Another physics example is search for the existence of antimatter. The Big Bang origin of the universe requires the equal amount of matter and the antimatter at the beginning. Experiments at LHC is trying to create a condition very close to the Big Bang. In fact, it's through working at lab, I had the honor to meet Gigi Lolandi. <clears throat> but if the universe has come from a Big Bang, there must be equal amount of matter and antimatter. Now the universe is 14 billion years old. The question is, where is the universe made out of antimatter? The existence of antimatter, let me remind you, come from Paul de Rock. In his Nobel lecture in 1933, he, he pointed out the equation of motion for relativity and quantum theory must appear as squared. Therefore, equal to m times m, also minus m times minus m. So Dirac asked, what is minus m? Therefore, lead to the theory of antimatter. So for a truly outstanding physicist, getting a Nobel Prize is quite easy. The first antimatter, Pastor Tuang, was discovered by Carl Anderson in shortly after. And this picture is shown in his Nobel Lecture in 1936. So we now know in the universe there are nuclei like helium and carbon. So the question is, is there an anti-universe where there are anti-helium or anti-carbon? Cosmic antimatter cannot be det detected on Earth because matter and antimatter annihilate each other at atmosphere, in the atmosphere. Matter and antimatter have an opposite electric charge, and therefore you need a magnet to measure the charge of antimatter, so positive going one way, negative going another way. The first attempt to look for antimatter was done by George Smoot and Louis Averett in a balloon, in a supergalactic magnet. But balloon normally go only for a few hours in space. This experiment will last 
for 20 years. So this is the detector. It's a five, five meter by four meter by three meter weighs seven and a half tons. Compare the experiment, Professor Bellatini and uh, uh, Professor Rolandi are doing in Fermilab and at LHC. This is a small, small, small thing. And it has 300,000 channel of electronics and 650 microprocessors. Nevertheless, I was told by NASA to put a detector in space. The cost is weight in gold. Therefore, you need seven and a half tons of gold to put it in space. So AMS is a trillion electron volt precision multi-purpose spectrometer. We all know particles and nuclei are defined by their charge and energy. So the first detector is called transition radiation detector. We identify positron and electrons. Then there are seven la nine layers of silicon tracker in a magnet in a magnetic field, therefore measure Z and P. Electromagnetic colorimeter developed in Pisa by Professor Cervelli's group together with Marco Incagli, and these measure electron and positrons. There are time of flight counters, measure Z and uh, E, a magnet measure sign of charge, a ring image in Cherenkov counter, measure Z and E. Therefore, charge and energy are measured independently by many detectors. Because space shuttle is so expensive, and so this is a U.S. Department of Energy-led international collaborations involving many countries, many institutes, and uh, many physicists. The detector was assembled at CERN with the major CERN support. The cost is not small. <clears throat> and I got this cartoon, and people said that we have, uh, we just decided to launch money directly in space was cheaper. Before that, uh, I worked with uh, Giorgio Bellatini, Piero uh, Braccini, and many other people. We have never done an experiment in space. So I got this cartoon, uh, as soon as I proposed the experiment, and said, it's time we face reality, my friend. We are not exactly what rocket scientists. So many people think we were not going to make it. Because of that, so the first thing we did was to build a detector with exactly the same size fly on the space shuttle in 1998. I remember my conversation um, with uh, uh, the NASA, the head of NASA, and his comment was, well, you may have done some experiment some experiment on the ground in accelerator, but space is very hostile. I did not appreciate that sentence until years later. Now, to build a magnet, because nobody has put a magnet in space for long duration, so we built a magnet. The magnetic field are designed with a permanent magnet material in two closed loops. So looking from outside, this cancels this, this cancels this, this cancels this, this cancels this. And therefore, there is uh, no torque because there's no field outside. And it is safe because there's no field leak out. 
and there's no return iron. In 12 years since we built the magnet, the field has remained constant to 1%. The first seven magnet mainly to understand our calculation. And then we built three full size magnet, one to simulate acceleration during the shock launch, and the second is to do a destructive test. The magnet is made out of 4,000 pieces of permanent magnet material. So the forces between them is about four tons. And you have 4,000 pieces. If one of them goes out, we we'll destroy the space shuttle, and this will not be good. And therefore, we we'll build a magnet, try to destroy it. See under what condition it can be destroyed. And third is a flight magnet. The magnet was made in China by the Chinese Space Agency, and the main reason for that is the best permanent magnet material come from Inner Mongolia. Inner Mongolia at this moment is part of China. But the design was done at MIT. Time of flight system, there are two banks on top, two banks on the bottom, and each has two photo multiply on one end, two photo multiply, multiply on the other end. Now, this is used the technology developed in Bologna by <coughs> Nino Zikiki's group, which provides a time resolution of 160 picoseconds. This is a difficult thing, because we have an electromagnetic calorimeter at the bottom, and uh, Franco Civelli wants the minimum amount of material on top. And so we want this to be very thin. In the meantime, we want to be reliable. So this is the group from Bologna, and there's Professor Cantin, Laurenti, and Federico Pamanari, and others. Since cosmic rays goes in all directions, but you only want the up and down particles. And so you need a very precise veto counter. And this was developed in Aachen and with a, a uniform light collection by putting optical fibers. And the measured efficiency 0 0.99999. Transition radiation detector identifies positron electron and transition radiation and nuclei by DEDX. And so when an electron goes through a radiator to the boundary of the radiator because its speed is very, very close to the speed of light, and so you have transition radiation, typically eight kilo electron volt. And this is collected by proportional by proportional tubes, and the proportional tube then give out a signal. Protons and nuclei give only DDX. So the difficulty is you want to make this two meter long proportional tubes, and you want to make sure it does not leak, because in space you have very limited supply of xenon and CO2. And you also want to make sure the wires are centered. And this is mostly done in Aachen with support from Rome and from MIT. This is Professor Scheer, who's key person in building this detector. So 9,000 tubes were manufactured. 5,000 were selected from 9,000. How do you know they're correct? And so what we do is at night, go to a hospital, assume they are patients, and let it go through and make sure you select the 5,000 they are centered by a CAT scan. And this is the group from Germany who spent about 10 years to finish this detector. And this is the installation of a transition radiation detector 
in, in, into AMS and give you a, a feeling of the size of this detector. In space, we have measured the performance and we see the proton rejection a 90% positron efficiency from, one, from low energy to one TV is order of one part in a thousand. At near one TV, the rejection efficiency is less unless, unless you reduce the efficiency of positrons. Once you reduce the efficiency from 90% to 70%, you get to 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 3. Silicon Tracker is a large collaboration. It's one of the important contributions from Italy and from uh, Switzerland, from Germany. The coordinate resolution is 10 microns. And these were constructed mostly in Italy and in Switzerland. This is one of the plans. And this is uh, Professor Bruno Bertucci from Perugia who supervised the installation. And uh, this is coordinated by Roberto Battistone and gave me a picture of his team dressed like an uh, Italian flag. And uh, this is uh, Professor Butterstone with the United States Senator uh, Bill Nielsen and with G Giovanni Bignami and Johann Dietrich Warner during the visit of uh, Senator Nielsen. Senator Nielsen is the chairman of, U chairman of the Committee on Science and Space of the United States Senate. So we have nine planes. Each plane has a coordinate resolution of 10 microns. But the resolution by itself has no meaning and unless you know where the detector is. So the inner detector is monitored by 20 laser rays. And the outer detector is monitored by cosmic rays every two minutes. So every two minutes, you know where the position is. So in the first 18 months, we monitor layer one, layer two, all the way up to layer nine. You see the accuracy across the X coordinate as, and as a variation of the Y coordinate, they're within four microns. So it's very accurately measured. Rain image Turing counter identify nuclear charge by the thickness of the Turing ring and measures velocity by the size of the ring. And these are examples of aluminum at 9 TV. The second one is a calcium at 20 TV and iron at 26, uh, iron at 0.8 TV. And this is a detector, mostly done by the Spanish and the French, coordinated by Giuliano Laurenti of Bologna. And he has 11,000 photo sensors. Colorimeter was invented here, I already mentioned. And this has 50,000 fibers one millimeter in diameter distributed uniformly inside 600 kilogram of lead. And so the one millimeter lead with optical fiber and millimeter lead and by fibers. And so the fib by putting the fibers in perpendicular direction, so you measure the shower development in three dimensions. It's a really a very, very nicely done detector. I have not been able to get it better picture of Franco. And this, <laughs> this is a picture of Franco with Marco and others in the installation of the detector. Two detectors were built. One for tests, for mechanical tests, on, on calibration, one for fly. The angular resolution of the detector at high energy is better than one degree. The calorimeter separation performance in space 
shows the proton rejection power typically is between 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, mostly in the 10 to the 4 range. So as I already showed, uh, Bruna uh, supervised the test and uh, installation. Electronics, there are total 300,000 channels produce 7 gigabit per second of data. It's processed by 650 computers to reduce to 10 megabit per second so the data can come down from space to your laboratory. For example, in Silicon Tracker, there are 200 computers and processing 200,000 signals. While we were building the detector, in 2005, NASA decided to cancel all the experiments in the space station. And so we were suddenly removed from the shuttle flight. It was restored four years later, mainly because of strong endorsement by world's leading scientists. So let me share with you. Here's a letter written by the Under Secretary of Science in the United States Department of Energy to the head of NASA, Mr. Griffin. And the letter says, AMS is important for DOE. And we are continuing to support AMS for its scientific potential, even though AMS is not currently manifest in the shuttle. Namely, DOE is telling NASA, you do whatever you want, we are going to continue support, support AMS. Of course, in Washington, each bureaucrat are independent, nobody listens to each other. Finally, the United States House and Senate in 2008 passed a legislation ordered the government to provide additional flight to deliver AMS to space station. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time the Congress making a law supporting a small scientific project. We have received this mainly because of strong support from scientific community. And this is an article in Washington Post, and here is a description quoting Steve Weinberg, and says this device could make discoveries that are earth shattering. We have an opportunity now to do something worthwhile fundamental science on the space station, and they are resolutely turning their back on us. And then also Mr. Hawking, with a special visit, come to CERN to talk to me. Also, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy strongly supported us. And this is a visit to Jack Marburger with uh, uh, some, a scientist from Taiwan and Roberto Battiston. After the detector, is finished. We put the detector in the electromagnetic interference chamber to make sure our signal will not interfere with the NASA signal. And then we put it in a thermal vacuum tank where the temperature is minus nine, 10 to the minus nine bar, namely like in the vacuum. Uh, this, the, the pressure, the temperature goes from mi minus 90 degrees C to plus 40 degrees C. Namely, simulate exactly what you have in vacuum, except zero gravity. To do that, we do receive very strong support from the European Space Agency. This is a letter written by Jiang Jiak Dodan, the Director General of the European Space Agency, which says, I confirm and grant the highest priority to MSO2 in providing access to test facility in order for you to meet your launch date. By then, 
because, uh, because the behavior of NASA, we do receive very strong support. And we also test the detector before and after the thermal vacuum test to make sure the temperature has not destroyed the detector. And the vacuum test is very important. The, the beam test is very important because we test with many particles at many energies at many positions to simulate condition in cosmic rays. So in August, we test with protons up, up to four, from 400 GeV and 1,000 points, the electrons to 300 GeV, positrons to 180 GeV, pions to 180 GeV, pions to simulate protons in TeV. And then after we finish the detector, we found it's actually too big for a commercial Boeing 747. And so I had to go to the US Air Force to borrow a C-5. C-5 is a rather large airplane. And uh, uh, the, fortunately for us, the chief scientist of the US, of US Air Force is a physicist. And he was actually very sympathetic to us. And so, fine. So a C-5 came from the United States and loaded us in, in there. So when we move to Kennedy Space Center, the most important test was to make sure AMS will fit to the markup <coughs> of space station. So make sure everything will fit. Because if it doesn't fit, you are in space, then you are in a small trouble. The night before the launch, I had a dinner with the astronauts and their wives. And uh, I was quite, quite tense, because after all, many people worked together for many years. And uh, not too long ago, uh, many of the astronauts had an accident, didn't come back. But uh, to my great, uh, great amazement, and they all appear to be very, very calm, except me. So this is the night before the, the, the launch. Just one second. And the launch is at 8.55, a.m. And the total weight for the shuttle the liquid tank, the two solid rocket booster, is 2,008 tons. And the weight of AMS is 7.5 tons. Two days later, the pilots gradually bring AMS, uh, bring uh, the space shuttle approaching the space station. And then it was installed on May 19th, at the 5 a.m., after four hours of checking, we found out everything survived, and then we start collecting data. So in space, this region is where the space station can be observed on Earth, and these are the orbits. It rotates around the orb Earth's orbit every 93 minutes. This is dark, and this is dark, this is light. And there are three satellites which collect the data and send from, uh, from, the space, from the space station to NASA and then send to CERN. The thermal environment on the space station is constantly changing because the position of the sun. If the sun is here, this side is hot. Science on top, the top is hot. Science on the left, this side is hot. Remember, you are now in a vacuum, and therefore heat, there's no heat transfer. Also, 
the arrival or departure of uh, Russian space vehicles and the movement of the radiator can change the condition, thermal condition on this on AMS. Also, the movement of the solar panel shades AMS. So in a very short time, the temperature can go from plus 40 degree to minus 20 degree. Goes very, very quickly. And we have no control of orbit, the movement of solar panel, and radiators. Because their main purpose is to make sure the six astronauts can survive. And to keep us in constant temperature, we have 1,000 temperature sensors and 300 heaters. And this is our control room at CERN. Now, as uh, uh, I mentioned recently, before this experiment, both Franco and Marco and myself did not realize in space there's no such thing as shutdown, no such thing as upgrade, no such thing as weekend or Christmas, because the space station always moves and therefore you have to be there all the time. It's an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate thing we forgot and it needs six people all the time to watch this. And so data analysis is done by people in Italy, in Switzerland, in Germany, in France, in Spain, in China, and in Taiwan. Uh, as I mentioned, the physics objective of uh, AMS include the origin of dark matter. Collision of ordinary cosmic rays will produce positrons and antiprotons. Therefore, if you plot the ratio of positron to electron positron, electron plus positron, as function of positron energy, you will expect from ordinary co cosmic rays, the rate goes down with energy because the number of positron goes down with energy. Similarly, for antiprotons. But collision of neutralinos, a leading candidate of dark matter, will produce additional positrons and antiprotons. So if a neutralino has a mass of 400 GeV, you have this curve. If it's 800 GeV, you have this curve. And so the characteristics will be the positron fraction goes up and then have a very sharp drop, similarly for antiprotons. Well, I want to make a comment on search for dark matter, because you read on the newspapers and people have made a very sensitive dark matter and never found it. But there are three independent ways to look for dark matter. The classical way, done in Grand Sasso and in many experiments in the United States, <coughs> it's a scattering experiment. Neut neutralino interact with proton, go to neutralino interact with proton. You do it underground, so you make sure you have neutralino. You use xenon, and so you can detect the recoil. And this is the classical way, and this so far has only produced negative results. But then there are other ways done by CMS, by Atlas, at LHC, proton, proton, produce neutralino. And then there's annihilation. Neutralino, neutralino annihilation, produce positrons, antiprotons. The fact these three are not related to each other can be easily visualized by recording the physics of electrons and protons. In physics of electron protons, you have production, proton, proton, go to electron, positron pair. This is done at Brookhaven, this is done at Fermilab in LHC, leading to the CP violation, J, Upsilon, Top, Z, W, and Higgs. Then there's a scattering. 
electron proton scattered. This leading to the discovery of partons confirmation of the electron wave. And then there's annihilation. This is done at Spear, at PEP, at Petra, at Lab. And this leading to the Psi and Tau discovery. So the fact you do not see Tau in, in, in scattering does not mean Tau does not exist. And so the fact you do not see neutrino from this scattering does not mean it will not be discovered in LHC or in space, because they are totally different production mechanisms. This is a concept most people sometimes try to forget, because they are totally different things. We now have many results, including collision of ordinary cosmic ray, namely trying to understand this cosmic ray background. And these are from proton spectrum, helium spectrum, electron spectrum, boron spectrum, carbon spectrum, and so forth. And then we have results on dark matter namely positron fraction and anisotropy, positron flux, and antiproton. And then I will share you, with you in 10 years what we will see. This is a measurement of proton flux as function of kinetic energy. Before us, there are many, many experiments. They vary by 30, by 30, 40%, sometimes factor two. And the red point is AMS measurement. The accuracy of an AMS can be easily visualized by look the measurement of flux of helium. Before AMS, there were many measurements up to few TeV in rigidity. Rigidity means momentum per unit charge. And you can see they're different by quite a large amount. In AMS, we analyze 200 million events. And this is the signal, and the rest are background order 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4 level. With such a large amount of events, and because we have calibrated at CERN, and this is our result in red. So now we measure the flux to order of a percent. This is for helium. And this is the electron flux. Before AMS, you can see the variation, large variation between different experiments. We have calibrated the electron flux to a few hundred GB. We have two detectors, one ECOL, one TRD, and matching with the track in the magnetic field. And this is the AMS measurement of the electron flux. Now, please remember the electron flux goes up and then goes down again in a smooth curve. When we go to positron, it will be quite different. Uh, the proton flux and helium flux are the most fundamental things in cosmic rays, and therefore it was a great surprise. There was an announcement from Pamela Group in Science Magazine shows the proton flux, helium flux, is not smooth, but has a break. I think hundreds of papers has been generated to explain that. But all measurement in, in blue does not produce this. All measurement shows is completely smooth. This is important in the sense this proton flux up to 400 GeV was measured carefully at CERN. So we know exactly how the detector behaves. And this is also similarly for helium flux. <coughs> this is our measurement of the electron positron flux Many other measurements, this is one done by Fermi and by many other people. The electron positron flux, you do not need a magnetic field. 
and this access near 100 GB has aroused much interest. If you read the New York Times, people claim there's a major discovery, and our experiment contradicts that. The first paper we published was uh, April last year, and so far has generated quite a few hundred explanations. And this paper says the positron fr fr fraction as function of positron energy first decreases with energy as you would expect because positron flux goes down with energy. And then unexpectedly it goes up. Goes down is what you expect. Goes up means something new has happened. But the rate goes up, it's not linear. The rate essentially flattens out. And from 100, 200 G, 20 GV to 250 GV, the slope decreases by order of magnitude. And there's no sharp structures inside. If you put on a linear scale, you will see the positron fraction from AMS goes up, essentially become flat. Soon, in a month or so, we'll publish your data to, 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 to 500 GB and later on to much higher energy. This data is different from previous measurement in two aspects. One, of course, is the size of the arrow, and B is absolute value, and C, perhaps more important, is the trend. We do, the, it doesn't go up linearly, but the, it flattens out. <clears throat> if you compare with the model, it fits to a mo dark matter neutralino model of a mass of a few hundred GV. But this is necessary, but not sufficient, because you have not measured the sharp dropout. <coughs> Indeed, or measurement. Agreed with the dark matter model of neutralino of 700 GB or a pulsar. The pulsar, of course, generates strong magnetic field. You can produce electron positrons. So until you measure to one TV, you cannot distinguish them. And so it's important in the next 10 years we can measure to one TV. A very important thing is uh, the excess positron. If it is particle physics in origin, if it's from dark matter, it should be isotropic. And this is our measurement of a deviation in sigma from an isotropy. The two black region is uh, because we fly at 52 degree, and so we cannot see these two regions. And the data shows it is totally isotropic, and the anisotropy is less than 0.3%, or 3%. This is the positron flux before AMS, and shows great variation. With such a variation, it's very difficult to make a conclusion. This is our measurement. Our measurement shows the positron flux first increases, but somehow unexpectedly it turns flat and then it goes up again. A structure, a smooth curve is easy to understand. A structure goes up and flat and goes up again. It's very, very difficult to understand. We indicate that something else is producing positron and its origin we do not know. So, in the past 100 years, measurement of charged cosmic ray by balloons and satellites had typically 30% uncertainty. We will provide cosmic ray information with order 1% uncertainty. The third time improvement in accuracy will provide new insight. It's just like you look at an object with your eye or with the, telescope, with the microscope, you see two different things. And so in that sense, the space station 
has become a unique platform for precision physics research. Now, what are we going to do the next 10 years? We'll continue to look for dark matter, search for existence of antimatter, and search for new phenomena. This is our measurement of positron at very close to 1 TV at 870 GV. This is the front view and the side view of the detector. I show this to show how clean these events are. In 10 years' time, based on our current data rate, we will, we will produce this curve if the po excess positron comes from pulsars. If it's from dark matter, you have this curve. And this is, not, this is based on our current measure rate. So in a short time, we will know. And an isotropy, we will make measure the an isotropy to accuracy 1%. An isotropy is very important because the poles are have a direction. And dark matter has no direction. And then we can measure antiprotons. This is our measurement of protons and deutrons. And this is the measurement of antiproton. The antiproton spectrum is exactly like a proton spectrum from AMS. This means in 10 years' time, if we have a neutralino mass of 1 TV, we will have this curve, the blue one. <coughs> you have no antimatter and no dark matter you have a green one. So far, we only measured to this region. Very soon, we will map out this whole region. Now, this cannot come from pulsars because in a magnetic field, you do not produce protons or antiprotons. A photon can go to electron positron very easily. Go to proton and antiprotons much, much more difficult because of the mass of the proton. So if you see this, give you much more confidence that you indeed have observed dark matter. So I already mentioned we want to look for antimatter. And on the space station for 10 years, we will search for the existence of antimatter to about 1,000 megaparsecs close to the age of the universe. Now, search for antimatter universe is one of the main research topics in high energy physics. There were enormous amount of work search for baryon genesis in the last 40 years. And baryon genesis means absence of antimatter, absence of antimatter require a new symmetry breaking, a very strong CP violation, and also require proton decay. Proton decay has been measured in super-K with a lifetime of proton larger than 10 to the 33 years. Symmetry breaking has been looked at Brookhaven, in Japan, in SLAG, in Fermilab, at CERN, and Kermitella at LHC. The, exp the experimental fact is no explanation has been found for the absence of antimatter. There's no, re no experimental reason antimatter should not exist. This contradicts to most of the theoretical physicists' in interpretation because most of the theoretical physicists would tell tell me that uh, we know why antimatter doesn't exist because we require proton, if, as long as we have a proton decay or C, strong CP violation. But the simple experimental fact is proton decay and the new symmetry breaking has not been found. What we want to do is to do a simple search, independent of the theoretical opinions to increase the sensitivity to a few order of magnitude and change the energy to one TV. 
I recently, two weeks ago, I had a conversation with uh, my good friend Steve Weinberg. And uh, he said, no, 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 this is useless. And I, I said to him, uh, look, Steve, uh, what happened if, uh, if we found antimatter? And he said, no, then I have to rethink. If you don't do experiment, you will never know. Now, to look for antimatter, the most important thing is to make sure your detector can map out the matter in space, map out all the elements in the periodic table. This gives you credibility. Only when you see all the elements, you can look for the opposite charge. So this is the measurement of a periodic table in space, up to z, up to z equal to 26. We can measure to very high z, but there's simply no events. And so this shows the detector is sensitive enough to look the same periodic table in the opposite chart. Another interesting subject is strange quark matter called strangeness. It was first proposed by Ed Wheaton. Jack Sandweiss from Yale is uh, with us doing this experiment. The idea is very simple. All the material on Earth is made out of two quarks, U and D. A diamond has Z over A equal to 0.5, and it's made out of U and D quark. So the simple question is, is the material in the universe made out at least U, D, and S quark? A very simple question. But if U, D, and S material exists, Z over A will be less than 0.1, and this can be simply answered by M. If you think about it, it's really strange. There are six types of quarks, and everything on Earth is only U and D. And so, the cost of the space station is not cheap. It's 10 times of LHC. LHC has four extremely powerful experiments. On the space station, only have a, this little small experiment by the pe people in Pisa and, and myself and others. Let me make an additional comment on applications. This experiment is the only experiment where the missile designers from China and from Taiwan are working together. Normally these people working toward each other, not together. And uh, use this technology, and together with the technology uh, developed in Chinese satellite system, Roberto Battiston has developed, at least in my opinion, a very good application to monitor earthquake timing and location from space. And the idea is a very simple one. That is, uh, if, if you have earthquake, before the earthquake, the magnetic field will change. When the magnetic field will change, the, the flux will change. So you need a very small detector rotating around the Earth. And so latitude will be provided by projection to the ground of observed location of the precipitation of particle bursts, and longitude is provided by energy dependence and time observation precipitating particle bursts. It's a very, very good idea, now strongly supported by the Chinese earthquake administration. And this has already shown that before the earthquake, indeed the particle bursts appear in a nearly six sigma level. So this is a simple experimental base that this is a very important thing, a fundamental thing to pursue. And this is their, <coughs> this is their design, <coughs> and give me the name Matteo Ricci, a Jesuit priest, he came to, went to China, I think in 1610. 
It's a very simple detector based pa partly on AMS technology. And there are many other applications uh, which uh, I will not discuss at this moment. But Cosmos is the ultimate laboratory. Cosmic rays can be observed at energy higher than any accelerator. So the, but the most exciting objective is to probe the unknown, to search for phenomena which exist in nature we have not yet imagined nor had the tool to discover. By this, I mean the following. Let me share with you how I understood the discoveries in physics. When I start doing physics, the highest energy accelerator, one is at CERN, one is at AGS. Both of them, the original purpose was to study nuclear force, pi on nuclear interaction. At CERN, the discovery of neutral carbon leading to the eventual discovery of Z and W. At Brookhaven, the discovery is two kinds of neutrino, time reversal, non-symmetry, fourth quark, the J particle. Fermilab was built in 1970s. At that time, the opinion of the expert was to study neutrino physics. What was discovered was the fifth quark and sixth quark. In fact, uh, I just realized uh, yesterday and uh, uh, this year marks the 20 years for the discovery of top quark by <laughs> Professor Balatini and people. And then in SLAC, was built in 1970. Original purpose was to electron proton scattering, study property of electricity. What was discovered was parton, fourth family of quark, and third leptons. <laughs> in Hamburg, the large electron positron collider, the original purpose was to look for the sixth quark. What was discovered was gluon jets. Super K in Japan, the original purpose was to look for the lifetime of proton. What was discovered was neutrino has a mass. Even Hubble telescope, the original purpose is to do a galactic survey. What was discovered is the flat coverage of the universe and the existence of dark energy. So when you build something new, you ask experts' opinion. What are you going to do? What you discover with a precision instrument almost never from the original purpose. If you think about it, you can understand it because the original purpose from experts' opinion is based on existing knowledge. The advancement of physics is to break down from the existing knowledge and then, then you can move forward. And therefore, I may waste one hour of your time, said uh, Franco and Marco and uh, others will, will look for dark matter, antimatter. In 10 years from now, what we discover, nobody can predict. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ting, for this very inspiring talk. There are so many young students from Scuola Normale that I'm sure have very much appreciated the, the story of, uh, of beautiful science that you are doing. Are there questions? You should ask any question you want. Hmm? I have to ask questions, so let me start, because the students must uh, really ask questions. Uh, what was the time difference, uh, distance between those uh, uh, flares, uh, uh, bursts, and the earthquake? What was the time distance between that uh, uh, um, burst of photons and the, and the earthquake? You mentioned this. Oh, uh, this, uh, this you should ask Professor Badistone. He has done a very extensive study. I think it's the order of hours. Yeah. 
If it's an order of seconds, it has no meaning. It's an order of hours. And the Chinese were very interested, very impressed by his work, because the China, like Italy, is uh, there are a lot of earthquakes. The Chinese Earthquake Institute has uh, 100,000 people. 100,000 is a small number in China. But it just shows the issue of the problem. I'll just ask from some old experience, um, how long did you have to do thermal vac for the instrument? Two months. And for vibration? Uh, vibration is about a month for different detectors, for separate detectors. Where did you do the vibration tests? Something that large? Uh, um, vibration tests of the magnet was done in Germany. Okay. Uh, a, a, a magnet assembly detector. Vibration itself was done in China. Now that vibration for the magnet, it's a tricky business because before us, all the vibration table are made out of uh, steel. And so you cannot put a magnet on it. That's why I was asking about uh, that. And therefore, uh, they have to build a special structure Otherwise, you know, you, you can put it on, you cannot remove it. <laughs> Sir, please. So there are uh, some uh, important discrepancies between the res um, MS results and uh, some other uh, recent experiments. For example, uh, the proton spectrum measured by, the proton and helium spectrum measured by Pamela, and the electron plus positron spectrum measured by Fermi. May you comment about uh, this uh, discrepancy and what you think uh, how the community may decide in future between uh, this? I, uh, I am not, this is a very important question. I'm not qualified to, to comment. I can only mention uh -huh, all results have been checked very carefully and very pleased <laughs> We test the entire detector extensively at CERN in this energy region. So we know the response. And uh, each experiment is so different from others, so I'm not qualified to comment on other people. I can perhaps only guarantee you all results probably is correct. Others, uh, other things I better not say. I'm not qualified to say that. Franco, you have a comment on that? <laughs> are different detectors with different resolution, different acceptance, uh, different magnetic field concerning positrons. And obviously, uh, this is up to each experimental group. Each one of us uh, uh, correlate his measurement with some error. We did the job. And uh, our responsibility is the dimension of the, uh, our experimental error. That's it. Then people uh, uh, can compare the results. That's it. What you ask actually is very important. Uh, as I mentioned, we can, this experiment was started in 1994. So it's a long time to do this experiment. And it's not cheap and require the Congress of the United States to make a law to do it. And so my colleagues and I are very aware of this fact, that we need to do this thing carefully, slowly, make sure there's no errors. Because it will be not possible in the next 20 to 30 years for other people foolish enough to repeat, to put another magnetic spectrometer in space. And therefore, it is very important we do it correctly. One, one last question. 
Um, at the moment, there's a small political problem in uh, the East called the Ukraine. And Russia is a major element. Um, it, it's the only way you can get right now to the space station to do resupplies. So what's the current state of the continuation of the experiment given the, given the political climate? Very good question. And very interesting question. Uh, NASA first do not allow its workers to have anything to do with Israelis or with Chinese. Okay. So no Chinese or Israelis work. Uh, Israelis are not in the experiment. There are some Chinese in our experiment. They are not allowed to talk to NASA people. Okay. Fine. The next thing you can do, you have to follow the law. Now, about a month ago, I suddenly got a note from NASA. The NASA employees are not allowed to talk to Russians. Not allowed to talk to Russians. With the exception of the space station. Because space station, they, they depend on uh, Russians to send send a, uh, send a, a rocket up. For us, we do not depend on anyone. As long as the space station is there, we do not need anything. Long time ago, we made a decision to stay away from astronauts. Because they cannot fix your things anyway. We, we are outside, and so, uh, I would imagine, uh, with or without Russians, we, are st we, we will be safe. And s unless the space station falls down. Otherwise, we, have no, we should have no problem. It's always a bit embarrassing to ask questions to a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, even more so if it is a comment. <laughs> So I'll try my best. Um, uh, this, is, this slide is certainly very interesting, but in my opinion, uh, there is the risk that it could be dangerous. Um, uh, I ask myself uh, uh, what, uh, which experiment one could put in a, say, anti-list, uh, experiments which reach their aim. First, the obvious one is LHC, for instance. Uh, the super proton anti proton uh, uh, collider with the discovery of uh, uh, Z uh, and W. And I'm sure you can fill uh, the list much better than I can do. Um, so, uh, this list could be dangerous if it falls in the hands of you know, enemies of science. They could say, well, physicists don't really know what they're doing. And <laughs> uh, so uh, I would be, feel more comfortable if uh, the list uh, would be accompanied uh, by, as I said, an uh, anti-list. What you said is very important. What you, I, I understand what you say. For example, the discovery of antiproton, Babelton was specially built, right? and the discovery of Z and W, with a clear prediction from, uh, from early measurement and discovery of Higgs. There, there is a small class, important class, where you build accelerator to confirm the theory. But uh, to a simple-minded experimentalist, uh, the most important thing is to go beyond the theory. That's, how, that's why I made this slide. I'm totally aware of the other things. A, a good example okay, is the lab. Okay. Gigi and myself spend a lot of time at lab. And lab, everything we, dis we measured, we measured very precisely, agree with the electroweak model. So the question you ask yourself, what have you learned? 
you say, gee, I confirm the electroweak model. And then you will ask yourself, suppose you have a measurement shows the electroweak model is wrong, and then perhaps it's more interesting. And one day, indeed, you may find such a thing. And that's how I, I fear about this. Without, uh, I try. To, I don't want to be respectful, but just uh, for curiosity, um, given the list and the anti-list, uh, where would you put the experiment which discovered uh, Charmonium uh, JPSI, for instance, uh, which was uh, measured by two different uh, experiments? I can only recall a conversation at MIT between me and Shelley Glashow and Luciano Maiani. Luciano at that time was a vid, uh, visiting scientist, a visit, visiting professor at Harvard. That was, I think, in 1973, in August. And they come to my office, said, what are you doing? I said, I'm building a very precise spectrometer with very good resolution, comment of narrow resonances. And one of them said, this is rubbish. There's no narrow resonances. And you're wasting your time. So more than that, I don't want to comment. So you would place it in the Einta list. <laughs> OK, thank you. No, I'm just t telling you my little conversation with these two guys. Let me ask you a question. Yes. I mean, the fundamental point in your experiment is the, electron, the positron proton separation, and you have a fantastic instrument. And uh, uh, how will uh, it, how it stays? Uh, increasing the energy of the positrons in the region that you are still going to measure? Uh, you, uh, one TeV is okay. About one TeV, proton begin to have, single, uh, have transition radiation, and then you are in you, you, more difficulty. Uh, unless you do a tighter cut in the electromagnetic calorimeter. But it, uh, what you ask is a very important thing, and that is, we have put in the first detector, TRD, the last detector, colorimeter, separated by a magnet, so that electrons produced uh, in the first detector is swept away. It doesn't enter into a second detector. Risk of making an excessive number of comments. No, good, good, good. That's fine. Okay, I'll I'll just point something out. The last thing, the last two uh, items you have on your chart, um, HST and AMS, are not experiments; they're observatories. And one of the important things about HST during the phase of commissioning, I remember this very well, was um, expect the unexpected. It was, it was publicized by NASA as a discovery machine. I mean, never mind that the mirror was this little problem, uh, which, which in itself created a little bit of a havoc for about five years. But by the time that was fixed, it had no real mission. The point is, this is a telescope, and so is yours in a sense. The universe is your, your accelerator, and you've created not an experiment but something much more durable and, quite frankly, much more spectacular in the sense that it's an observatory. You don't know what you're going to find. <coughs> that justifies its continuation, exactly like VLT, exactly like VLA, exactly like the, the uh, 30 meter that's currently being built, exactly <coughs> like the LSSS. The, the essential point I'd suggest is when you say this, you cut out that part for the last two about what you were looking for. You've built a device to measure the universe. And that's very different. And I say that as just an old-fashioned astronomer. Uh, thank you.
I, I don't I don't see questions from students. Oh, a former student. So. <laughs> yes. Are you a student? PhD student, if that counts. <laughs> so, uh, both in, in AMS, but also um, at experiments at LHC, the rate of the, of the measurement of, of data is so large that all experiments now have to pre-prune pre this amount of data so that it can fit in our storage. And uh, this is often done through, like, I often hear about uh, neural networks or uh, uh, you said you have six, 650 processors on board that do some sort of pruning. And uh, I wonder if this does not, uh, kind of hides what the last column of your chart is, uh, is all about. So what if the new physics that we are all looking for is already being pruned off by by the pre-processing, and so it doesn't ever, it does not ever arrive at the desk of the of the scientist. A very important question. Uh, we have seven gigabit per second data rate. We have 650 processors on board to reduce to 10 megabit per second. Now, how do we know? We have not cut out important information. And this is one of the another reason we went to the test bin. To make sure that all the data, all the particles go in are correctly recorded. So you know you you have to in order to detect something, you must have a trajectory. So you make sure everything goes through the everything goes through the trajectory is recorded. Your question applies more to, to the LHC experiment. I think they collect in, with MS every single cosmic ray that goes through. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. The, 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 the processing is to, to reduce the information from the... Random uh, things, from noises. In, for LHC, for LHC it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a question, clearly. Yeah. Every cosmic ray go through the detector is recorded, not rejected. It's only the particle go to left and right, go through the magnet, these are rejected. Yes? Did you ever observe track pairs, coincident track pairs, with which uh, it would make sense to run a, a mass spectrum, track pairs? Judged, you get just single tracks? Uh, we have not looked for mass pairs. But I suspect we have not. The answer to you is we have not looked systematically. We do see small angle electron positron pairs converted in the top of the detector. We have not looked the pairs, and mainly we want to do the easiest thing, the simplest thing first. All the data stored there. So far, proton spectrum, positron, electron. These are the simplest things. You notice I have not given you a number uh, on anti uh, um, um, antimatter, I have not given you a number on um, uh, strangeness. Just do the simplest thing first. All the data are stored. <laughs> other questions? No other questions? Yes. for his students. Not uh, properly a student. So uh, I know that in a physics experiment, uh, one uh, a very important uh, issue is the, about the calibration. About uh, which what? calibrations? Which calibrations uh, do you have on board uh, and to ensure that the instrument is uh, properly working? It's some, okay, somewhat related to the previous one question. Uh, we have position calibration with the lasers, well, 20 laser beam to make sure the inner tracker doesn't move. And we calibrate the outer one with cosmic ray. And we calibrate the electron, positron, 
for TRD, for electromagnetic calorimeter. And so everything is continuously calibrated. And the color, for the position, it's every two minutes. You, you need to remember, in space, if something goes wrong, you do not know. Therefore, you have to always check it. No other questions or comments. I think we should thank Professor Ting again. Okay.